As car lovers and as people, we're taught that bigger is better. The more expensive thing has to be the better thing. And in the case of cars, that means the more money you spend, the more fun you must be having. Well, fun to drive can be a very personal thing, right? You might like power over handling or weight could be the only thing that matters to you. But you get a group of cars like this together and the best stands out very quickly. We've brought, as you can tell, a range of badges and budgets. We've got $30,000 here, $300,000 at the back. The engines are even all over the place. We've got two four cylinders. We've got a turbo, a hybrid, a pushrod Chevy V8. They're all here and they seem quite different. However, they share one major trait. They're all purpose-built, fun to drive cars. There is no rental car spec here available. Two door, low slung, beautiful styling and design to make the driver smile. So we're here to debate, can money buy happiness? And most importantly, What's the price of fun? Great cars, great roads, and all the reasons we love to drive. Road trips, comparisons, test drives, and podcasts. This is Everyday Driver. Whatever type of fun car you're looking for, you can find it with Autotempest.com. From cheap used finds to crazy exotics, Autotempest searches all the car sites so you don't miss the perfect car. Local listings to nationwide, classifieds to auction sites. By going to autotempest.com slash everyday, you can ensure that we can do more big comparisons like this and you can find the car you've always wanted. There's a car for every price of fun thanks to our friends at autotempest.com. All the cars, one search. We have to start right here. It's back, the show car. This is the car that we bought brand new from Toyota a little over a year ago, and we did a huge series of videos on it. We were incredibly excited to have one of the first GR86s in Utah, kind of in the nation. We loved this car the day we sold it, and it's back for this shoot because, come on, who else is making a really good, affordable performance car for the masses, well, there's really only one other option, and that's the Mazda MX-5, and that's the entire list. So we had to bring it back. Now, I know some of you are saying we aren't allowed to bring it or talk about it or say it's good anymore because of the RTV issues and the engines are bound to blow up. Every one of these is a ticking time bomb that can't possibly work. Well, let me tell you a couple things. First off, it's kind of like Porsche's IMS issue. Does it exist? Yes, there's excess RTV and in sustained 1G right-hand bins, how often do you actually do that? There is some oil starvation. So the problem does exist. However, your chances of it are very slim. I think there's like 12 cars right now that have actually been plagued with engine, real engine damage. 12 cars. Also keep in mind the current owner has tracked this car more than we ever did. And we drove it hard and cross country and tracked it and he keeps driving it and it's awesome. So while the problems exist, they've been massively overblown, kind of overshadowing what is really a rare and great car for $32,000. That's why it's here. This is an interesting car to have in this lineup because it was $32,000 out the door. So it is one-tenth the cost of that big McLaren that we brought. So it shows you the spectrum of what we're talking about. That's right. It's the lowest priced car here, so we can't compare it to anything else yet. We're driving all of these in order, ascending order. So this is the baseline, the benchmark. That's the key thing I want you to know about all five cars we have here, is all five are brought for a specific reason, because we know they're good, we know they're fun, and we know that any one of them we'd give our top four-star rating and we would own. So we've already got a baseline of excellent vehicles here, and I, I don't want you to misunderstand that we're coming into this and anything can lose, because they're all great. And I know that sounds like, oh, this is gonna be boring, but the whole point here is to talk about what makes a car fun and how much does price relate to that? The intention of the GR86 started with the GT86, that Scion brand. It was an experiment. Let's give people a fun little lightweight cheap sports car. And it's grown into something genuinely world-class at a low price. Yes, it's the lowest power. Well, actually, no, it's not. It's 228, the Lotus is 190. It's not the lowest horsepower. 
but it's not the lightest because it's 2,900 pounds, 228 horsepower, 184 pound-feet of torque. This is nearly a thousand pounds heavier than the Lotus, but what's interesting is it's about 500 pounds lighter than everything else we brought. Even the lightweight 911 weighs about 300 pounds more than this. Zero to 60 is six seconds in this. That's, you're not bragging to anyone about that, but it has enough power to do whatever you'd like. Except, of course, for drag race. Don't, don't drag race, it'll, it'll lose, but okay. I've always wanted more power in this. The GR86 gave that to me. I'd like 240, 250, but as it is, with all of these cars, I am happy leaving them perfectly stock exactly where they are at. The power of this car, I would only describe as enough. You have to still think about your passing zones. This is a car that still requires some involvement and thought because it doesn't have power that will fix everything, but it has enough to do anything you'll need. You can't tell me that the level of fun in this is not comparable to these other cars. Oh, oh, oh. It's the interaction. It's the feel through a corner like this. The car wants to play. Now this being a front engine car, the only front engine of the group, when you turn in, you can tell that the weight is on the front of the car and it's gonna kind of murder that outside wheel to corner, but it doesn't have a ton of weight and it's close to 50-50 weight distribution. The best thing about the GR86 is that feeling of keeping your speed. When you come to a corner real hot in some other faster car, well, any of these other cars that are with us, you come in hot, you gotta brake and then turn in and roll into the power and you're applying track driving techniques. But the GR86 is really one of the only cars you can hold your speed and just turn in. And as a matter of fact, maybe you roll onto the gas sooner. And that's why you're so quick through the corners. Ooh, see, I don't have to brake. I can just dive in. That's just special. You're just going to marvel at how this little car hangs onto a corner like this. Well, it's the wheelbase, but it's the tuned chassis, the dynamics to make it rotate. This is one of the longer cars of these five, and it has one of the longer wheelbases. Of course, the C8 is bigger than everybody. This doesn't have an incredible amount of steering information from the wheel, but the car is constantly giving you really good info. You can tell how the dynamics are gonna change based on your steering inputs. So while there's not a lot of road texture, there's a lot of information about what the car's doing. The GR86 is the car that proves high speed isn't always the most fun. It's a weird statement. It makes up for the lack of speed with the corners. <laughs> That's the feeling of the GR86. That's what I love so much about it. It's just so delightful to drive. It's so friendly. And the best part about it is the knowledge that you did not pay too much for your fun. 30 grand for a car as fun as this. Because it's the cheapest, it's also the simplest in here. It doesn't have really high-end build because it's not a very expensive car. But it is well-built. It's just affordably built. And because it's affordable, it doesn't feel daunting like I'm in my unbelievably house and career wrecking car. If this dies or if this gets wrecked, what happens to my entire life? Not that $30,000 is no money, but compared to everything else here, that's an affordable way to go out and have some fun. What if you don't want to put all that money into some kind of hot sports car because upkeep on this is cheap? Yeah, it's as fun as a supercar, right? How can a little car, one with a Toyota badge, be any fun at all? It's like the foundation for fun. When you get a more expensive car, it has a more special feel, and that could up the fun. But when you get an inexpensive car, you don't feel precious about it, and that definitely ups the fun. So easy, so easy. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mike, uh, we, but you bought the tires too, so the tires are kind of ours, so I, I, I had to, I couldn't resist. This car is one of the easiest I've ever driven for having accessible edges of its dynamics. And it's not because the edges are low, it's because this car is just, it's easy to work with. 
you don't feel like this is something that is the most precious thing in your life. You just kind of want to explore it with more confidence and less fear that something could go awry because if it all goes wrong, it's a $30,000 car, not a hundred or 300. But the fun level is higher on this car. It's unexpectedly high and that's what I felt when I first drive it. That is the whole reason that Todd and I bought one. I didn't pay very much for my tires and my brakes and the car didn't cost very much. And I'm still having about 95% as much fun as you are. 95, maybe 90? It depends on the car. And I wanna quantify the percentage. I am desperate to quantify this. But this is the baseline. This is where we're starting. This is one of the best manifestations of that dream and pursuit and desire in the hearts of car enthusiasts everywhere. This is why we drive this car. This is why we love driving. Everyday Driver is brought to you by Grio's Garage. Use the code DRIVER10 for 10% off your order. This is Todd's Lotus Elise, and it's part of our long-term series. We chose it because it represents a world left behind, naturally aspirated, unassisted steering, and very few creature comforts. But this also is something that manufacturers don't do anymore. Light, loud, pretty much unsafe. Something never to be seen again. The price, new, was about 45,000, somewhere in there, 42 to 45, pushing 50. The price has dipped and Todd bought this for $31,000, but now the prices have gone back up to about 40. Nice ones are 60. I mean, Todd's got a lot of miles on it and he's driven it, but that's the whole point of what you want to do. The reason the value has gone up on the Lotus Elise is because this is representing cars that aren't made anymore. This car has involvement about it that modern manufacturers aren't allowed to do. They could, they're not allowed to. Put alongside the other cars here, this does begin to feel old. It is old, it's by far the oldest car in this group. And it shows you what cars used to be while still being a fairly modern car. 2006 is not that long ago, but in car technology of the last decade or so, that's a lot of changes. But if we're gonna talk about what makes a car fun, this car not only represents a step in price, but it represents an era we've left. Of all the driver's cars we brought, this is the most driver's car. This is the one most focused on doing nothing else but having you interact with the car. And most people cannot believe that either of us will fit. I mean, Todd's big, I'm six foot three as well. <laughs> we fit fine. There is a lotus position you have to fold yourself into to get in, but once you get past that, you're gonna wonder why all sports cars aren't like an Elise. I've always felt like Colin Chapman built his company into something so great, it was almost to their detriment because it was lightness at all costs. And that's what you buy when you want an Elise. That is what you get here. This car weighs less than 2,000 pounds before you add a driver. So, so now it weighs over 2,000 pounds, but significantly lighter than the current Mazda MX-5 Miata. Think about that. This is the better part of 500 pounds lighter than that car. People don't think about 2,000 pound cars. People don't think about weight when they're looking for their fun car. They think of power. But this is the lowest powered car here. Now, this will beat pretty much no one in a modern car from the light. If you're worried about drag racing, this car is lost on you. If you're worried about, you won't believe how powerful my car is, that's not this car. 190 horsepower, just over 130 pound feet of torque. This is one of those cars that has made me not care about numbers. I don't care about zero to 60, I don't care about horsepower. Passing is a breeze, not because the car has a lot of power, but because it's so light. We've gotten to where we excuse weight because cars are so powerful and they have so much good assistance that we have forgotten that weight kills enjoyment, that weight kills immediate response. There's no automatic rev match. You better get it right for yourself. There's no steering assist. There's no cruise control. This has 
just the stuff you need to enjoy driving and nothing else. Now that begs the question, do you like that in your sports car? Is that what you call driving fun? For me, second cam, it is. That's what it's about. That's everything it's about. This is a very analog experience that's asking you to be very involved. The car is tiny. It's very loud. The air conditioning rarely keeps up. This car is probably one of the most unfiltered cars I've ever driven. And then there's the build. It's not that it is lacking sound deadening. It's that you're looking at aluminum panels. I can see exposed bolts. Very few cars, if any nowadays, short of kit cars, allow you to see the construction of the car. That's what makes this so special. I don't want anything else. I don't need the stereo to be good. I don't need the air conditioning to be good. I don't even necessarily need to take a pasture. I can, but they better be small or really like me. It's like kids built this because kids don't think about anything other than wheels and a steering wheel when they build their go-kart. It just feels like engineers were given carte blanche to feel like a kid again and just build something with wheels. Well, nothing else matters, nothing. But then the professionalism kicked in and you get a gorgeous looking car that still looks like a supercar. It looks like two or three times the price, maybe more. But the key thing that doesn't happen anymore is this has no assist steering. Fully manual, unassisted steering. This has all the road feel, and there will be no other car that has benchmark steering feel like an Elise. That is why this car is in the lineup, because it's a solid benchmark. I've never driven anything that transmits as much information to the driver as the Lotus Elise does, and it's one of the main reasons I love it. If you're a person who you understand steering feel and you don't think it's all that important, but you've never driven a car that has no steering assist, then honestly, you've never actually felt real steering feel. You may actually hate it because it's too much information from the road. This car is a fire hose of info all the time. And if you're a person who likes to have nuance of feel of what's going on with your tires, you can't beat this. On a racetrack, I'm perfectly fine with that. As a matter of fact, I invite that. That's what I want. I look for that. But I want a car that can kind of shake off road imperfections, still give me great steering feel, and remain precise. The car's so light, it's just going to bounce around, which translates into the steering. So you have to bring all your concentration, much like you're riding a motorcycle. Now that's great, but does that make it more fun? The steering rack is fairly slow compared to modern standards. The pedal travel is kind of large. It requires you as a driver to be active and involved. All of these cars have less steering feel than the Lotus. We haven't even gotten to the upper three yet. You want the lightest feeling car, the, the lightest weight, the most delightful, laughter inducing car that you can buy, it's still an Elise. But I have to decide to be here and sweat and tolerate the noise be occasionally uncomfortable because I get this driving experience. Can you sacrifice? Are you willing? That's not everybody. Elises are nothing short of amazing to drive. All of your senses are going to be in play. There is no comfort to be found here. It's like driving on track going to the store at all times. And I like that some of the time. This is utterly focused on being fun at all costs, at the expense of everything else. This is focused on the fun driving involvement factor, and it does that at a level I've never been able to match in anything else. However, you've sacrificed everything else in order to get that. And for many, many people, I think that makes this car really tough and hard to recommend. And while we talk about it on the podcast and I have raved about it over the years, I understand that this is not a car for most people. You don't want to commute in this car. You do not want to be following people. You have to be by yourself. And once you are, it's 100% of the fun. But you take away any little piece out of that equation, the fun goes below the GR86 all of a sudden. Nothing for me is as 
pure fun as this. When I start to think about other things, I start to realize it's because I want other factors than just a fire hose of fun. Todd wants to drive this all the time. I don't. I want to drive it only when it's on, only when it's good. Just give me the good stuff and skip straight to the end. Everyday Driver is brought to you by PowerStop. Brake upgrades made easy. Yep, here it is. We had to bring it. This is the C8 that the show owns. It's actually pretty much Paul's car. That's right. The Porsche guy has a Corvette. And we brought it here because, well, it works perfectly price-wise and to discuss exotic car, fun car, usable car. What is the C8? Some of you are saying it's not a real Corvette. I challenge you that you don't know your Corvette history very well. We did a film called American Original. We can explain why that thinking is wrong. But the reasons that it's here are, well, not because it's automatic only, that's a little bit of a bummer, but it doesn't understeer like you've heard. I mean, it can. All mid-engine cars will understeer. Surprise. Also, the price is right. This list for about $70,000 like this, it was 81 grand. You still don't see very many. I know this because we go cross country and then people oogle at it like, what is that? It's a C8 Corvette and it's here. You've probably noticed by now that we are using the exact same stretch of road to compare all these cars because we need some sort of control part of the drive. When you step up to a car with this much power and an entirely different chassis, it helps to know the road, but it also helps to feel this exact road when driving the Corvette, the C8 Corvette. As always, Chevrolet and Corvette have prided themselves on a lot of performance for the money, and that's still true here but now we've done the revolutionary jump to mid-engine architecture. This sells more cars than any of these others. I mean, the 911 is up there, but the Corvette has far more volume sales. But that means there should be a lot of fun that goes with it, right? This has the Z51 package, so you get more power, better brakes, better aero. The differential has been revised. If it weren't for the mid-engine configuration of the VET, this would feel unengaging to drive in comparison to the Elise and the GR86. What's amazing to me is how insulated from speed that I am in this car. I, okay, that's a number. In comparison to those other two, this feels like a barge. This feels like a luxury sedan. This is the biggest and heaviest car of this group. And that does mute the driving experience. For me personally, it does reduce the fun as well. This car does handle its weight incredibly well. And that has everything to do with the chassis engineers at GM that are wonderful and their great magnetic ride. This can ride in touring mode like a big luxury car, but you dial it up here to track and it will astound you with how well it handles that nearly 4,000 pounds worth of weight. Going from tour to sport, listen to that. You can control the settings that you want and suddenly the Magna Ride from GM transforms this car into a driver's machine. The fun part about this is the driving position because this is supercar driving position for not supercar money. It's interesting to have this car in the same company as that McLaren because there are a lot of things about them that are incredibly similar. They're both mid-engine architecture, they're both dual clutch only, they're both dealing with quite a bit of horsepower. This has less than the McLaren, but is the second fastest car here if you're concerned about the drag race. A three second zero to 60 is, uh, need I remind you, pretty quick. You're not gonna sit around and go, yeah, that car just feels slow, because it doesn't. It's quite quick. Up to this point in our film, the cars that we've been driving have been manual transmissions. That alone makes the car fun. I don't care what it is. But the only way it comes is with this eight-speed dual-clutch gearbox, which is very, very good. Kind of Ferrari thinking, even though I feel like there would still be more buyers for a manual transmission Corvette. And you know, maybe they will come out with it, but logistically speaking, from an engineering standpoint, the shift lever would be this tall, and you might hit your knuckles on the screen. Chevrolet only built this architecture to have this gearbox, and I have to give it credit. It's an incredible dual clutch, one of the very, very best out there. 
Having it as rear wheel drive only, having it with this great Magna Ride suspension, it is amazing how satisfying this is to drive. It makes it easy for every level of driving skill is available here. That's what makes the Corvette special. Track mode just made the steering heavier, but it didn't make it have more feel. Unfortunately, there's far more pleasure to be found in cornering in the GR86 and the Lotus. I mean, the Lotus especially, right? But you will be astounded that you as a driver can now hustle a sports car like this. But there is speed to be found. I'm just not as engaged as I am with the other two cars. This is the exact opposite thinking of the Lotus Elise. Instead of being something where we only gave you what you needed, we gave you what you needed for a great driving car and then all the other stuff you'd like to have on a luxury car, that adds weight. This is supercar quality performance and enjoyment for something that doesn't have a supercar price. And that is amazing. It's not just, hey, Corvette is a performance bargain. It's a bargain for the full experience. Everything about this suggests supercar. And you didn't pay close to supercar prices. The intention of the Corvette has always been to be the highest performance, the most for your money you could possibly buy. And the C8 Corvette is no different. The fun here comes from the power, and it comes from this driving position. But I feel like the car is insulating me from a lot. But you know what? It needs to insulate itself from a lot of customers who are gonna buy this, because this is the aspirational thing that you've saved up for your whole life. You want a Corvette. What most people are pursuing when they think, I wanna buy a supercar, is realized here in the C8, maybe better than some supercars. Actually, yeah, better than some supercars. This feels incredibly impressive. I don't know that it accomplished feeling special. The speed in this, I really felt like I was going fast in the other two. In this one, I'm just kind of watching the speedometer and watching the world come at me. Okay, it's interesting, it's not as fun. We had to include a Porsche in the lineup, and the 911 is the obvious choice. But of all the millions of variations of the 911, why did we choose this Carrera T? Well, it's Porsche's longest running mark, and they still offer a manual transmission in their Halo car. Now the MSRP on this is $115,000 brand new, back when it sold new in 2019, but in the minds of many enthusiasts, this is kind of the base model, even though it isn't. You can still get a Carrera for less, but it's not the driver's enthusiast car. So it is above a Carrera. It's kind of comparable to an S, but that's just in terms of price. It's actually, in my mind, a little bit higher. This 2019 Porsche 911 Carrera T means it is the 991 generation. And a reintroduction of the T lineup, which that trim is supposed to be touring, but what they've done is made their driver's car. It's the hidden one. It's the one that doesn't appeal to everyone, and that's what a fun driver's car is. But something got lost with this 991 generation. They lengthened the wheelbase and they tried to make it more comfortable and more neutral. My issue with a lot of modern 911s is they become so refined and they become so focused on being a do-it-all that they've lost some of the edge that fun sports cars should have. This Carrera T brings it back. In fact, this is the more affordable, a little bit more focused Carrera T than the one they make in the 992 generation. Coming into this review, the categories that matter to me in quantifying fun are power and handling, of course weight, the style, but most of all, am I laughing through corners? And in the 911, I am laughing. I love 911s. No, no I don't. I don't love all of them. I love this one. The Carrera T gives you some of the really good driver-focused bits from some of the upper trims and puts it on a car with the base Carrera engine. So this only has 370 horsepower from its 3.0-liter 6. If you think about it, that McLaren has almost twice the horsepower that this does from the same size six-cylinder engine. Granted, that one has a hybrid system, but still. This isn't about power, even though 
370 horsepower twin turbo with 331 pound-feet of torque isn't slow. <laughs> Fun as a flat six. That sounds so good. The turbo whistle is fun, but the lag is almost non-existent. So therefore, it feels like it's a naturally aspirated engine. I love that. Ooh, hang on. Give it, give it throttle. <laughs> the Carrera T is set up to be a driver-focused car. Remove some of the things that make some 911s feel kind of distant and overly refined and get it back to you as a driver. That means thinner glass going on, a little bit of weight reduction. You get a mechanical limited slip differential. You get a shortened stick on the six speed, even though the ratios are the same. I'm having more fun because it's manual. I love PDKs, but this manual is brilliant to drive. This interaction is more fun. It is. And it gets the Porsche active suspension management and it gets a lowered suspension, by the way, too. Now, 911s have always had some interesting front end steering magic in feel because, of course, they have a rear engine and they're alone in that world in modern cars. Their old school, non assisted steering was very special and their hydraulic was good as well. Porsche has done a better job than most of making their electronic steering feel work, but this is still not a lot of actual tire information. There's good car information here. It tracks like I expect, in fact, a little better than I expect because of the rear steer. You can feel the car rotate more than makes subconscious sense for the amount of steering input, and that's because it has rear steering. The best part about this car is the rear axle steer. It is like peanut butter and jelly. All 911s should have rear axle steer. That does make it neutral. That does make it interesting and fun. It's got that precision. It's got that chassis control and I'm feeling a lot of the road, but it's not jiggling my hands and jumping around and making me feel a little bit out of control. No, no, <laughs> I'm feeling like the road is mine now. For being the lightweight Porsche, it's not all that lightweight. I mean, I don't even have back seats in here, which you could get as an option. This still weighs about 3,200 pounds, which is kind of normal for a modern sports car. It's difficult for me to fathom that this is the lightweight version, but I do understand that it is the more driver-focused version. The whole feel of the car is very driver-centric and pushing away some of the creature comforts in interest of you just having a good time. And that actually makes me engage with it quite a bit. I like it more than the C8. Jumping right out of the Corvette into this car, you feel it. 400 pounds doesn't sound like a lot, but instantly, the way this car carries itself and composes itself, I'm concentrating, I'm, I'm having far more fun. 73% more than all the other cars. I mean, what's the number? It's almost like this Carrera T captures some of what I enjoyed about prior generations of the 911 while bringing it up to the larger chassis that is the 991. So it, it is a blending. It is a best of all worlds scenario for your 911. But I'm struggling with where it ranks in sheer fun. Okay, maybe it's like 84% more fun than all the other cars. I need a lab coat and a chart and a clipboard to tell you that this is more fun and more money means more fun. Yes, you can buy happiness. It's called a 911 Carrera T. This is the best iteration of the 991. Weight and steering sensation are my two big things. That's what keeps coming back to me as we drive these cars. And I am incredibly impressed with how agile this is and how well it rotates. I don't know that I come away really marveling at how fun it is. Capable, absolutely. Maybe it's the one you've ignored. Maybe it's the one you don't really understand why it exists in the Porsche lineup among 25 different variations of the 911. But if you have a Carrera T, I guarantee you, you will know something that only the other Carrera T owners will know. It's the interactions. It's the quantifiable, although empirical, fun. I'm not a 911 evangelist. That's something that apparently all automotive journalists are supposed to decide. And if you are of that mind, if you're rage typing at me because I don't think the 911 is the greatest thing ever, then the Carrera T just wins this because this is an excellent showing for the 911. If you go up to like the Turbo and the Turbo S, they, they start to become wickedly powerful and fast and less involving in the process. 
this is involving and I love that. This kind of lightweight feeling is what Corvette should do to the CA Stingray. There's a question on my mind though, and as much as I love this car and as much of a Porsche file as I am, admittedly, I know there's other cars out there. And I'm intrigued by other philosophies besides Porsche. I want it all is what I want. Paul's gonna love this, isn't he? Paul is going to wax lyrical about this 911. He's gonna be probably somebody I have to pull out of the car. My price of fun has gone up in this car. I really like the others. But I haven't found love yet until I reach the 911. The McLaren Arturo is our last car. It's here representing, well, all of those crazy supercars and hypercars. I feel like every week there's a new one. Yeah. And this one's here representing them all. This is their first all new car since the MP412C. And guess what? It is now a hybrid and it's rear wheel drive only. And McLaren has decided to give it a name. Did you notice? Artura. It's not just a mess of letters and numbers. It actually, it means something. I'm not even sure what, but it's here. Crazy price, crazy power, crazy doors. This is the upper end. You might think with a show name like Everyday Driver, it just means we're not interested in supercars or hypercars, and of course we are. The key thing for us is that you love the car you drive every day. If you have the means to pick up a supercar and to drive it every day, well then you absolutely should make it your Everyday Driver. It's not limited to cheap cars, but many of the supercars we have driven over the years have brought us to the inspiration for this piece, because I hate to say it, a lot of them don't drive all that well. What's crazy is over the last decade or so, since the introduction of the Bugatti Veyron, there's a lot of cars out there well over a million. They're fast, they're impressive to look at, and the numbers and bragging rights are very high, but the actual engagement on many supercars isn't very good. This is McLaren's newest model. It's not their most expensive, but this is a lot. As spec, it's $289,000. The paint alone was $5,500. They started at about $230, somewhere there, $233, $235, which is a lot of money. I mean, we're talking double the price of the 911. I'm in comfort mode. I haven't even switched up to sport. There's four modes in this car because it's a hybrid. It's got a 94 horsepower electric motor, and it's got a battery pack, and it's got this brand new V6 engine, twin turbo, three liter, 120 degree V6, that makes almost 200 horsepower per liter. But their entire philosophy is everything must exist on the car for a particular reason. So how do you maintain that philosophy when you're adding a battery and an electric motor and keep the weight to 3,400, somewhere in there, which is not the lightest car here, but it kind of feels it. This McLaren Arturo represents a staggering amount of all new for a company the size of McLaren. Every McLaren prior to this has been built on the MP412C chassis. This is a restart all new electronics, which they had trouble with the first round of electronics. Apparently they've had some software issues with the second round. They believe are sorted now, but this is a restart on all their electronics. It's got an ethernet based system and they started over on something that big companies haven't attempted. Just like every single other one of these cars, it wants to be driven hard. I am fascinated with this car. But you know what? Living with it has allowed me to drive it harder and faster without worrying about it so much. You will recognize this instrument pod from the McLaren Elva. 
Yes, it is the same. The interactions are the same. Over here on my left side, within fingers reach, I have the suspension settings. On my right, I have the engine settings. So I can turn it back to comfort over here and electric on this side. Engine just turned off. I've got half a battery because I've been hammering along in an upper level that actually charges the battery and now I'm all electric. Here's what's surprising about that. This car doesn't stop feeling special because you went into electric mode. It doesn't stop being interesting because it's now just worrying down the road. That's an accomplishment. It's quickish in electric mode. It's, it's not really fast. It, it doesn't really impress you, but you jump in here to sport mode, engine fires back on, you go to track, now the engine is really on point and charging the battery all the time and pulling from each source to get the most out of the car. And what that's done now, what hybridization has done for companies is give you that instant electric shove. Time to go manual. Aha! Aha! Oh, that sounds good. That's a hundred? What? Okay, you only get 11 miles EV only range, but that EV motor, that electric motor, mm, 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 that gives you the shove and the gas engine backs that right up with the torque and the, the high end revving. <laughs> Zero to 60 and under three. Does that mean I'm having more fun? Well, right now, yep. <laughs> oh. Almost eight and a half thousand RPM redline out of this V6. 120 degree V, and essentially what that's done is give them an easier way to get the exhaust out of the engine and get all that stuff out of the engine so more can go in more quickly. That wasn't zero to 60, that was zero to 90. Because we're here, why not? It wasn't even a great launch. The brakes are good, but they take quite a bit of effort, much more so than I'm used to in a modern sports car. I'm not a huge fan of these carbon ceramics because you have to have heat, massive amounts of heat in them all the time. And the brake bite is not immediate. There's a, a stiff pedal feel and then a bite. You've gotta be really aggressive with these brakes. That's a lot of braking. Holy crap, this thing. McLaren uses hydraulic steering, but it's technically hydroelectric steering is how they refer to it, which is very interesting. What that actually means is the assist is done hydraulically, which is wonderful. But what powers that hydraulic pump has traditionally been the engine, not on a McLaren. On a McLaren, the hydraulic pump for the hydraulic assist is powered by the electricity. There's so many good electric power steering racks out there, and I almost don't care about the ratio. I care more if they feel good. The feel is consistent here, and it's electrohydraulic, so technically speaking, that's still pushing fluid, which is what we want. This is what I aspire to. Look at the steering wheel. There's no buttons on it. it. Just needs to be the steering wheel. And the carbon fiber shift paddles, well, it's, it's actually one bar. So when you pull left paddle, the right one goes forward. When you pull the right paddle, the left one goes forward. It's connected. Everything's connected. This feels like they're steering weight because the steering is doing something. It's connected to actual honest to goodness wheels down there somewhere. Now there isn't a ton of information here. I don't feel like I'm getting like an overwhelming amount after the 911. I think there's a minimal improvement in the amount of steering information from the road, but it feels incredibly precise and it doesn't feel the least bit disconnected. A lot of times the electronic power steering just, it feels like ones and zeros. It feels like all of the weight is just manufactured at the hub. Which brings us to the suspension, which is also all new. McLaren had that hydro pneumatic. It was a weird suspension that nobody else was doing. It wasn't struts and springs and sway bars. The suspension was cross connected. It was very complicated and actually surprisingly cool, but that's gone now. We've gone back to traditional suspension, sway bars, double wishbones front and rear, struts, springs, all the stuff you're used to. And interestingly enough, they have accomplished better grip in the rear than even the 720 has. 
this feels sorted. The weight balance, well, there is no transfer. It just, it doesn't move. And that adaptive suspension is absolutely brilliant. I just feel like I'm flowing the most in the Artura. McLaren never before has been able to produce an eight speed, eight forward gears, eight speed transmission, and it is a twin clutch. Reverse gear is now just the electric motor. It just simply reverses polarity to put you in reverse. So that means reverse will always be silent electric mode, which is kind of what you want. That's totally fine. Which means that gave them more room and space and less weight to be able to produce an eighth gear and give you eight forward speeds. That's modernity. That's what I'm talking about. And that's a hundred? What? This has the kind of grip that feels like it's accomplished with aero. It's really just stuck to the earth and very flat. The handling is, oh, it just sucks me in. There's a wonderful organic weight to the steering and the car is doing things that feel subconscious to what I'm asking. The grip here is immense. Pirelli P0 tires, in fact, it's the cyber tire with a chip in it that talks to that new electronic brain and tells the brain all about how it feels about itself as a tire. That's going on here. It feels like I, I attached myself to this car and we are one. It's actually quite a bit better than I was expecting it to be. It is the steering feel. It's absolutely fantastic. It's almost like the Corvette feeling, only lower and more exotic, because those wheels feel like they're at my ankle bones. It's just easy. It's easier than the Corvette while being more interesting than the Corvette. Not worlds better. The Corvette is very good, but this is just another layer of fun and engagement. And the visibility is one of the best I've encountered in a modern car, let alone a sports car. It's unbelievable. I love the Porsche, but it doesn't feel like this. And yes, I'm having more fun in this. And I keep reminding myself, and you, the cars are hard to get together on camera. There's no Italians here. I wish we had an Italian. But I'm not convinced that I would be having more fun because this is absolutely brilliant. This is fun that makes you want to be a better driver. This is one of those cars where I'm 25, sometimes 30 miles an hour faster at all times than I think I am based on what the car is telling me. And generally when that happens, the car is kind of boring me because I feel like the car is doing it without me. Somehow this McLaren has accomplished feeling very quick and very capable, but feeling like I did it, not feeling like the car did it for itself. That's becoming increasingly rare in modern cars. And this is only $300,000. We could go twice the price. We could go way up into the millions of dollars. And then I am convinced you won't be having more fun because you're worried about people dinging you. You're worried about the wheels getting scratched. You're worried about the oil change cost. You're worried about the maintenance. You're worried about the insurance. You won't drive it. This, I feel like, is the sweet spot between paying a lot of money and having something exotic and not seeing yourself coming and going and having the steering feel like this and the tech that this car is. This car feels worth it to me. But it's only worth it if you drive it hard and thrash it and track it. I do like this a lot. I think Paul really likes it too. This is probably a car we'll agree on. I hate being susceptible to more expensive things. I hate it. We're having a good day. I mean, nobody's really feeling sorry for us with these cars, but to get any more than this, I mean, above $300,000, yeah, we know there's an entire world of cars out there, but it's hard to get these cars together on camera. We have asked, we have fought. We had an SF90, just a line we had all reserved, and it broke. It's still, uh, it's still a good day, even though it doesn't seem like not too many other people do this, because it's hard. It's hard to put all these cars together on camera. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking it's not possible to do a YouTube video and have all these cars here and not do a drag race because you want to know the finishing order. Okay, 
Here it is. We don't do our comparisons on a racetrack or a runway. We use a mountain road where there's real consequences and nowhere to race five cars side by side. But the pivotal part of a drag race is the finishing order. And in this space, that looks like this. Are you surprised? You probably already knew, as a YouTube drag race is the equivalent of reading stats in the back of a magazine. It can tell you which car has the best numbers, but you'll never know which one is the most fun to drive. The McLaren comes in first. A hybrid with lots of power means it should. The big V8 grunt of the Corvette means it beats the 911, and the weight of the Lotus helps it barely best the GR86. But if straight line speed from the light is the most important thing, we should all just buy an EV. Hi again, if you've just joined us or you've scrolled to this part of the video to see what our conclusions are, you've missed a lot and the beginning is that way. But these five cars we brought for a specific reason. It is the price of fun. That doesn't necessarily mean the most expensive car is fun. That's the whole premise. But I will admit we stacked the deck. We brought five cars we knew already were good. It's not like we brought something that's like, well, that one might not do very well. Any of these we'd take. All of them are four-star cars. We like them all but we have to make choices. What is our price of fun? I will admit to you that my price has gone way up after <laughs> experiencing the McLaren. The single biggest metric for me was slow or fast, the car made me laugh. Mm. That happened immediately with the Artura, not just because people were looking at me in the car. It sounds like we both agree that that car is fun. This is fun, but you can't always just say you spent the most money and therefore you're having the most fun because Great. that is the entire point. Yes. So we have to decide on two others mm -hmm. that we would also take. I mean, maybe at the same level of fun. I was thinking as we were driving, what if a Ferrari owner downgraded to mm. something like a Porsche or a Lotus? What if? Mm. And they were still having almost as much fun. Would they do that? They so might that's what even we're have doing. More fun. That's the thing. They could, yes. You could possibly have more fun. I realized as we drove these that I know fun is subjective. I, I realize it has to do with what, who are you, what kind of driver are you, and, and look, I'm not a drag race guy. Maybe you are. I totally get that. But the thing for me with fun is I want to feel like I'm never concerned that I'm just enjoying the car. I'm never worried about the car, and I'm not being filtered from anything that's going on. Okay. So as I get into more and more expensive things, they may be really special, but I start that, that thing starts to creep in where should I be worried? Should I be concerned? That starts to be a factor. Now I still love this. Yeah. But for me, I want don't filter out what's going on. I want simple, I want lightweight, and just let me experience the car because it's fun slow and it's fun fast. This is fun slow and fast. <laughs> I'm I'm with you. I'm marveling at this. And that is my requirement. I just have to laugh. Whatever mm. car is just making me continually marvel at its abilities, the harder I push, the faster you go, maybe not, even if you go slow into a corner and it just makes you laugh, that's my requirement. And the two that did, one that actually surprised me, you think I'll just choose the Porsche just because it's Porsche, but of all the 911s we've driven, which to this point I think is all of them. Pretty much all of them, well, yeah. most Most of them will yeah. say, I hadn't driven the Carrera T because mm. I kind of discounted it. I kind of oh, thought okay. it would just be like a, a little bit better than a Carrera. All it's right. a lot better. I was shocked at how much I like it. So this is my second choice. And then moving to the GR86, this is an old friend. I can't believe yeah, how much yeah. fun I had again in this car. And I went through the first corner and I just laughed out loud and I surprised myself again. What a car. So yeah, what if... You're going for McLaren, but what if you had a GR86 in the garage? That's excellent. I really do like that. Paul did pick the Porsche. I want to know that it is still everyday driver and the world is still balanced properly as you expect. <laughs> I also want to applaud Paul, my, my dear co-host, for not only picking the Porsche, but also picking the least expensive car here. That is that is that says a lot about how much fun it is. The GR86 made me laugh immediately. This is so much fun. So I choose the 911, no surprise, but it is excellent and the GR86. I did not pick the Porsche. I, I do have different metrics, and that is I'm not concerned about niceties. And I'm also a little bit concerned about the stress level. I don't want to be stressed at all. I want to be in the car and not worried about, wait, are they too close? What's going That's on? That's a little Which stressful. Which starts to be an issue yeah, here. Yeah. And the more expensive and, and special, if you will, cars get, the more you start to think about, well, can I take it? And should I be precious? And wait, what's going to happen? And I don't want any of that. I want to be in a car and feel like I can beat on it and take it wherever and drive it all the time and I'm not stressed. I love this so much. I know it's a foregone conclusion. Todd likes his Lotus Elise, but I just, I love this thing every time I drive it. Look, Todd will pull up to our group in the Elise. 
He's been driving slow, he's been to the store, he's been going fast. He gets out and he just stands there and shakes his head and says, I love this thing. That is the biggest sign to me. I'm, I'm not surprised you chose yeah, the Lotus, yeah, yeah. but I love that you did because every time you constantly acknowledge your love for this thing. I can't believe I've owned it as long as I have and I love it as much as I do, but I have to pick the Lotus and I'm picking the GR86. These cars are light, they're fun, I'm not stressed, I feel vital in either one of them. It doesn't matter if I'm, I can drive 20 and like both of these, I can drive as fast as they'll go and like either one of them. And then I feel like, let's go to the track, let's drive in the rain, I don't care, this is fun for me. You're not surprised that we picked the Artura, but it's not because of price. Well, okay, maybe a little bit because of price, but still, no, it it's is because really it's good. I'm very brilliant. worried about the price. It really concerns me. So my price went up. <laughs> if you add all three of these cars together, it's it's gone up quite a bit, but it's justified. So we ask you, what is your price? I've always been taught to think that the more you spend, the better a car should be, and therefore it's gonna be more fun. What if you were the owner of any of these other cars and you stepped down to the GR86? What if you could look at this car in the lineup and instantly dismiss it and say, nope, nah, you gotta get hotter. Why is more power more fun over this? I can't give you an answer, because it isn't. We drive a lot of cars for this show and it's very rare that I get in a car and I just think, I wanna keep exploring it. I wanna keep just driving it for a long period of time and, and, and play with the edges of the car and just enjoy being in it in all conditions. And the GR86 does that for me. It is a fantastic balance of being a car that feels modern, but a car that still offers a lot of the more simplistic, enjoyable, involving realities that a fun car can have. It's all the fun. You're having more fun maybe than any of these other cars, but only at specific times. Even if there's a hot car ahead of you, this ceases to be fun because I'm still faster than that car. Even as an owner, I, I drive this car and then I think, you know, it's really good, I like it, but there's a lot of other stuff out there. And then I climb into other stuff and go, have you driven an Elise? Because the amount of engagement, and for me, fun, that is here, I, I've never been able to match it in anything else I've ever driven. And that includes today. I like that I, I can hustle, but the car's doing much of the hustling for me. I'm not having to earn it. It's giving me a lot of power, and the suspension is very well suited for this road. But I'm still distant from it. I'm still not relating to the car as much as I want to. This is a great all-arounder, but it isn't the top of the fun list here. It isn't a car that I would pick just for driving fun. I would track this, we are driving it cross country, I would drive it every day, I would take it on back roads, it can do everything. But it's not the height of fun. It's a car that I never wanna stop driving. That tells me all I wanna to need to know. It's like the mattress that you instantly fall asleep on, that's the one you're gonna buy, right? The car that I never wanna stop driving, is the 911. Ultimately, I think this feels special for what it is in the 911 range. And here, it represents the 911 very well. I just don't come away thinking, of those five cars, which would I pick? I don't go 911 first, or, or second, for that matter. Third? Maybe. Above the C8, let's just, let's just say that. Power, check, style, gorgeous. Yes, it's great at handling. Okay, it's not the lightest thing here, but it feels almost like it is. This, for me, is what Lotus is to Todd. <laughs> I want one of these cars. This definitely feels more special than both the 911 and the Corvette. It feels less engaging than that Lotus Elise, but at the same time, I feel like modern McLaren is what Lotus wanted to grow up to be and then it's special enough that when you're going slower, it still feels interesting.
These things just happen. Watches the father teaches its young how to work. My hair okay? I work hard on my hair. You need his comb. I do. Well, he needs a brush wrangler, and then I, I need to just have hair, so there's that.